Hundreds of spaceships take off from Earth's surface and head toward Mars. Fast forward seven months, and this space fleet of ships is near the red planet. Soon they will all land, and a few thousand people will become citizens of Mars. Perhaps they will never return to their home planet, because there will be absolutely all conditions for a comfortable life here. It takes time and many expeditions to create a self-sustaining colony on Mars. Here is how, step by step, people might build a full-fledged city there, with factories, hospitals, apartment buildings, and even clubs and restaurants. First, we need to pick a time to launch the rocket. A launch window opens once every 780 days. That's when the distance between Earth and Mars is the shortest. In this case, the journey will take about 6 to 7 months. Let's move to the launch pad. Here, we see the spacecraft connected to a booster rocket. Ignition! The booster sends the spacecraft into the air. It then undocks and lands back on Earth. At the same time, the spacecraft's engines start, and it makes its way to Earth's parking orbit. To make this ascent, the ship has used almost all its fuel and now needs refueling. To do this, we use our booster again. A huge crane places another spacecraft on the booster. There are huge fuel tanks inside the ship. The booster launches from Earth and takes the refueler into orbit. It docks with the spaceship and fills it with fuel. The journey through space may need a total of five such refuelings. And for the first mission to build a colony on Mars, we need five spaceships. So that's about 25 launches from Earth. Considering that the booster cost $230 million, the refueler $130 million, and the ship itself is $200 million, the price tag on the mission is pretty impressive. So, ignition. Fast forward in time, and the first five ships descend to the surface of Mars. These ships haven't brought the first humans. They carry only payloads, like fuel and water supplies, oxygen for breathing, and medical supplies. There are also first living modules, waste management systems, and a huge number of solar panels for generating electricity. Before landing, one of the ships launches a system of satellites into orbit. It'll provide communication on the red planet. So, the robots begin their work on Mars. First, a whole bunch of little rovers line up and unfold solar panels. Their total area reaches the size of seven soccer fields. They're much less efficient on Mars than on Earth. Frequent sandstorms fill the working surface of the panels with sand. But at the same time, the strong winds of the red planet also help to wipe the sand away. Other rovers, equipped with powerful drills, begin searching for water in the Martian soil. When they find water, people will begin producing fuel. We'll combine carbon dioxide from the atmosphere with the mined water at a high temperature and under high pressure. It'll result in getting methane for rockets and oxygen for breathing. Since February 2021, Mars Perseverance rover has been testing the technology for oxygen extraction. It has a box inside. This is the Mars Oxygen IRSU experiment, also called MOXIE. This thing pulls Martian air inside and then, under high pressure, takes one atom of oxygen from carbon dioxide. Such a thing, about the size of a shoebox, can provide enough oxygen for one astronaut to breathe. But if you build the same mechanism but the size of a large factory, it'll produce oxygen for an entire colony and release the rest into the atmosphere of Mars. Another group of rovers is working to turn the surface of Mars into a landing zone to prepare for the next step in colonizing the red planet. By this time, the robotic population of Mars has been working on these tasks for two years and two months, and people on Earth have been waiting for a new flight window to open. This time, not five, but 12 spaceships are coming to Mars. Ten of them are cargo ships, which bring construction materials, fuel, and other supplies, as well as a lot of scientific equipment and 3D printers. Two other ships carry the first interplanetary astronauts. The doors of the spaceships open, and 30 heroes set foot on the surface of Mars for the first time in history. These people are scientists, engineers, and doctors. They have undergone a strict selection and long training to become the first people to conquer another planet. And these guys don't have a return ticket. They'll have to stay on Mars for two years. The astronauts live right in their spaceships and try to get used to the unusual conditions on Mars. The temperature here is about minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Also, the gravity on Mars is two and a half times weaker than on our home planet. That means a person here can jump twice as high and lift heavier objects. But the muscles in human bodies have a hard time getting used to such a difference. So astronauts can't work full time. The first thing they do is unload cargo ships and deploy life support systems. 
Some people are experimenting with turning Martian soil into material for 3D printers. Others are setting up greenhouses and cultivating soil to grow plants. The human waste recycling system the robots brought here is used to make fertilizer for plants. Two more years and two months have passed. We see a launch of a spaceship, not from Earth, but from Mars. The 30 astronauts have completed their mission and are on their way home. It's easier for spaceships to take off from Mars because the gravitational force here is less powerful. At the same time, ships are launched from Earth. They'll bring nearly 100 new inhabitants and even more cargo to Mars. When this space fleet arrives at the Red Planet, the astronauts can taste the first food grown here. 3D printers begin building homes on Mars. They print outer shells from Martian soil and plant waste. These shells will protect the dwellings from solar radiation and strong winds. And inside the shells, people will build permanent houses. They're inflatable and are equipped with modules brought directly from the spaceships. These houses have living bays, research bays, and communication centers. The construction goes on for two more years until the next flight window opens again. Some astronauts leave Mars, but more and more people come here with every new mission. They no longer live in spaceships. There are comfortable underground houses and 3D printed shelters. Most of the food is already produced on Mars. A new generation of robots works together with farmers. Other robots help to build even more houses to accommodate the ever-increasing human population. Two more years have passed. Various space agencies launch their missions to Mars. There are more people, more scientific equipment, and even tanks with fish. In 2035, Mars and Earth are at a record short distance. So people send a huge fleet of ships with astronauts and construction materials. By this time, the human colony looks like a small city with many interconnected domes. Its inhabitants have already begun building an underground network of tunnels to move between houses, laboratories, and factories. They've also built the first hospital. Two years later, the population of Mars reaches the 1500 mark. Almost all of these people will become permanent residents of the planet. Four years and two more launch windows later, the first restaurant opens its doors. Also, the construction of a nuclear power plant begins. Once it's finished, the Martians will no longer need constant supplies from Earth. From above, the colony looks like a small town. There's a farming section where food is grown, a living section, and a factory district. And with each new mission, people bring more and more solar panels. Now, their total area equals dozens of soccer fields. All this allows the astronauts to feel at home. They also don't have to wait for food supplies from Earth. 20 years of the human colony on Mars. Its population is now about 30,000 people. Workers begin to bring their families to Mars. The first schools are built here. 30 years. The population is already over 100,000 people. The colony's infrastructure allows it to be completely self-sufficient. People produce enough food, get enough fuel and oxygen. Around this time, the first plants start growing in Martian soil. There's more and more oxygen in the planet's atmosphere. The trees planted in greenhouses contributed to this. The greenhouse effect from all the human activity helps warm up the surface of Mars, if only a bit. People still have to wear spacesuits when they go outside. It will take many more years until people will be able to breathe on Mars like they do on Earth. Gradually, rivers and lakes will appear. Green plants will cover most of the land. And then the inhabitants of Mars will be able to go outside without an oxygen helmet and call the red planet, now green, their home. It's staring at you, and you're staring at it. A giant eye that seems to be pulling you into an abyss. You're hovering over it in your space copter. But however scared you might be, you still need to do your job. So you send your copter down to the surface of the red planet. Right, that's where you are, on Mars. But first things first, you take a moment to remember everything you know about the fourth planet from the Sun. It's the last of the inner planets. Those are the planets that lie within the asteroid belt. They're also called terrestrial, since they're made up of rocks and metals. The atmosphere of Mars is much thinner than Earth's. It contains 95% carbon dioxide and a mere 1% of oxygen. In other words, don't even think about pulling off your helmet. Anyway, there's no time to waste. You land on the surface of the planet and find yourself in a brownish-red world. That's a good thing you're wearing a spacesuit. This place is freezing cold. 
The thermometer sewn into the sleeve of your suit shows minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Time to take your first step on the Martian surface. The planet looks quite colorful, and the hue of a particular area depends on the minerals that make up the soil. The ground under your feet is covered in fine dust. It looks like rust. The same orange dust is in the air. Good thing you have your own supply of oxygen and don't need to breathe Martian air. The layer of this dust covering the surface of Mars can be from 6 to 40 feet thick. You hope you'll avoid getting swallowed by some Martian quicksand. You start walking, feeling very light. Mars is just 15% of our planet's volume and a mere 11% of Earth's mass. It means that gravity here is much weaker. Its pull is 38% as strong as the pull of gravity on the surface of Earth. You jump up and down and then try to run several hundred feet. Ha! Ah, you haven't even broken a sweat. What makes it harder for you to explore the place on foot is that the planet's surface is rocky, covered with craters and volcanoes, old dry lake beds, and canyons. You see something huge towering on the horizon, but you try to suppress your curiosity. You'll have enough time to figure out what it is later. Suddenly, a massive cloud appears in the distance. It looks as if a huge herd of horses is approaching you. In reality, you better get back into your copter and fly away as fast as you can. That's one of Mars's infamous dust storms. They mostly occur during the summer in the southern hemisphere of the red planet. They can sometimes cover the entire planet. And you see the largest ones from Earth. You hop into your copter and set a course for the eye that scared you so much. Winding channels that look like veins run through the eyeball. But the closer you get, the less it looks like an actual eye. Soon you realize it's a crater. It's giant, almost 19 miles across. Around the crater, which looks as if it has a pupil, there are other even bigger craters. They likely formed billions of years ago. That's when Mars had to withstand multiple attacks of space rocks. But why is the eye crater darker than the surrounding landscape? Scientists think that once, there was Martian water in the enormous pit. Remember those channels? They were likely carrying that water. And since the crater was filled with water, it stopped some substances and minerals from eroding away. Now, remember that towering something on the horizon? It's time to go and explore it. When you come close, you realize it's the largest shield volcano in the entire solar system, Olympus Mons. It's more than 370 miles in diameter, which is almost the same size as the state of Arizona. You tilt your head. Wow! The mountain is 16 miles high. It's also rimmed by 4-mile-high cliffs. To picture the sheer size of the volcano, let's make some comparisons. The largest volcano on Earth is Mauna Loa, towering around 2.5 miles above sea level and stretching 75 miles across. Sounds impressive. But the volume of Olympus Mons is around 100 times larger than that of Mauna Loa. The Martian giant could swallow the whole chain of Hawaiian islands from Kauai to Hawaii. But why is this volcano so large? It might be the result of lower surface gravity and higher eruption rates. Or the reason might be the red planet's crust, which is very different from Earth's. It's static. You see, on our planet, the crust is made of 15 to 20 moving tectonic plates. As plates move over hot spots producing lava, new volcanoes form, and the already existing ones become extinct. That's why lava can get to the surface through many vents. But on Mars, the crust isn't broken into the same tectonic plates as on Earth, and the lava has nothing to do but pile in one very, very large volcano. So, how about getting closer to the enormous mountain? But once you step out of your copter on Martian soil, the ground under your feet starts shaking. Well, that's a Mars quake. But how can it happen if Mars doesn't have any actively shifting tectonic plates? Specialists from NASA are sure Mars quakes occur when energy inside the planet gets suddenly released. It leads to rock fractures and cracks in the planet's crust. Another powerful jolt and one of such cracks opens right next to you. You fall to the ground, afraid to move. But soon, everything calms down. You wait for a couple of minutes, just to be sure, and get up. Oh look! Here's a perfect opportunity to explore the insides of the red planet. The crack is large enough to send a special research robot. 
The planet's crust is thin and consists of volcanic basalt rock. The mantle that surrounds the core of the planet is made up of thick silicates, oxygen, and some minerals. You can probably compare it with soft, rocky toothpaste. Mars's mantle is also much thinner than Earth's. It's just 800 to 1100 miles thick. As for the planet's core, it's made mostly of iron, nickel, and sulfur and is between 900 and 1200 miles wide. This core doesn't move. That's why Mars doesn't have a planet-wide magnetic field. Unfortunately, your drone is now lost in the depths of the red planet. You leave it there and continue your exploration. Your next destination is Valles Marineris. It sounds more like an Italian red sauce, but it's actually an enormous canyon, or rather a canyon system, that runs along Mars's equator. It's as awe-inspiring as Olympus Mons, more than 2,600 miles long and over 4 miles deep. The thing is so huge, it could span the entire continental United States from the Pacific to the Atlantic Ocean. Now let's make another comparison. One of the most famous canyons on Earth is the Grand Canyon in Arizona. But it's 10 times shorter and around 4 times less deep than this canyon on Mars. Some scientists think that Valles Marineris is the edge of an enormous tectonic plate. It moves so slowly that almost nothing has happened in that region over millions of years. And the movement of this plate probably began 3.5 billion years ago. Anyway, the only thing left on your today's to-do list is to visit Mars's moons. They're among the tiniest in the solar system. Phobos is the largest of the two. It orbits a mere 3,700 miles above the surface of Mars. There's no other known moon that travels closer to its mother planet. It whips around the red planet three times a day, while the second moon, Deimos, needs 30 hours to complete one orbit. Phobos is getting closer and closer to Mars, about 6 feet each 100 years. Within the next 50 million years, it'll either crash into the planet or break apart and form a ring. Happy but tired, you return to your spaceship. Tomorrow, you'll continue exploring the magnificent red planet. And who knows what discoveries are awaiting you. Ah, Earth. The third rock from the sun. The blue planet. You get it. Its atmosphere is made up of around 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and 1% argon, water vapor, and carbon dioxide. A nice balance for any living creatures to breathe. The weather here is also perfect for life to exist, unlike places like Saturn, Mercury, or any other celestial object in our solar system. We have the troposphere to thank for that. It's the densest part of the atmosphere on our planet and is 5 to 9 miles wide. It's the layer of the atmosphere that always affects our weather and secures the right conditions for life to exist and to have bodies of water. Earth is just sitting in its orbital path, minding its own business, revolving around the Sun until, bam! Venus and Mars swoop in and spoil the fun. No one wants to leave poor Earth alone. These two relatively large celestial objects moving toward Earth will have dire consequences for our planet starting with changes in its orbiting trajectory path. The planet's orbits in the solar system have to maintain the right balance so that nothing goes haywire. Of course, if any large object approaches Earth, it would throw our orbiting path off course. The planets will revolve around each other, which will cause plenty of natural disasters on our lands. This will also affect our rotation timing, potentially slowing it down. Days will not flow, but drag by animals that rely on daytime will need to readjust their biological clocks. Nocturnal animals will also need to figure out how to cope with the long nights. Humans have adjusted pretty well to the 24 hours a day timing. Time itself is just a human construct to measure things. We'll have a tough time sleeping and adjusting to the stretched day. Marine animals rely on the natural current flow to migrate around the oceans. With Mars and Venus crashing the party, it looks like they will also need to find new paths. Birds migrating to other lands throughout the year will also be confused and not know what to do. In general, the Earth's temperature will rise, and massive heat waves and permanent climate changes will occur. This brings us to our next issue, the heat. The radical temperature rise will turn everything into a barren desert. It'll be summer all year long, especially if Venus is in the picture most of the planet will dry up and won't be suitable for growing crops. 
Venus is hot. I mean, really hot. Even though it's not the closest planet to the Sun, it's still the hottest. The temperatures on Venus are close to 900 degrees Fahrenheit, which will melt you like an ice cube. The lands on Venus are generally flat, probably due to the temperatures. It's mainly hot because its atmosphere is thick and traps the hazardous gases inside. If Venus inches its way towards us, it'll invite those gases to our atmosphere and compromise it. Mars, or the red planet as we know it, is very cold. That might stay the same if it starts rotating around us. It's also home to the largest dormant volcano in our solar system, which makes Mount Everest look like a tiny bush compared to a tree. With so much instability, it might just wake up one day and spew out molten lava. Mars has a very thin atmosphere, which makes the planet chilly. Its gravity is quite similar to ours. It's actually very cold and has ice caps in the poles covered with carbon dioxide. The same is true for Mercury. You can only last there as long as you can hold your breath and be in the sweet spot between the sunrise and sunset. The three planets orbiting each other will eventually collide. It's just a matter of time. And the moon, just hanging out like a fly on the wall, will be so insignificant that something will eventually throw it off course and another planet will capture it to its orbit. Or, in the most dire case, it will collide with one of the two intruding planets. Earth will experience extreme tidal waves like nothing before. The two new planets revolving around Earth will cause a major imbalance, making our gravity shift out of control. Each tidal wave will be bigger than the previous one and will cover the dry land. Plenty of little scattered islands in the oceans will be completely submerged. Coastal cities and towns will also be home to fish. Flat countries in general will need boats to get around. Dams and dikes won't be enough to stop the water from coming in. Everyone needs to move towards higher ground to escape the floods. With the climate getting hotter, the polar caps will melt like ice cream on a sweltering summer day and add to the water level rising. Within a few months, the whole Arctic will be nothing but liquid. But wait, there's more! The crust will wear out due to the instability of the Earth's surface and fluctuating gravity. The Earth's crust is mainly made up of oxygen, which means we're basically walking on air. We might experience more earthquakes than before, and dormant volcanoes will wake up from their deep slumber. The skies will be covered in ash, making flights impossible. No one can travel by sea or by air. Importing and exporting will become history. The overall climate will get hotter, just like in Venus. The three planets orbiting each other and their huge mass might even unintentionally welcome other planets and celestial bodies to join the party. So, what if Jupiter decided to turn up? Now, Jupiter is the largest planet in our solar system. To give you an idea, the Earth would be just the size of a grape if Jupiter were the size of a basketball. It also has the largest storm we can perceive. That's known as the Red Spot, a place twice the size of Earth that has hurricane-like storms that have been going on for hundreds of years. Now, by the time you're done watching this video, you can expect the storm to still be going at it. Since the planet is huge, gravity must be quite strong here. It also has many moons, some of them of our little Earth. There will be no room for any proper space among the planets. Jupiter's moons will be thrown off course and latch onto other planets around. Some of the moons might collide with each other, causing massive debris to be displaced all over the place. The gravity of the planetary party will attract comets to enter the atmosphere, potentially crashing down on us. Oxygen levels will deplete, so the Earth's crust crumbling will continue. It'll rip open the ozone layer, causing heavy strokes of ultraviolet waves to enter our atmosphere. We won't be able to step outside for too long without some protective gear and oxygen tanks. Human civilization will change drastically. We'll all live in sheltered containers that will provide clean air and safe and filtered sun rays. The shelters will be sturdy enough to withstand frequent earthquakes. We will grow only enough crops to sustain ourselves until we leave the Earth. Since it'll only be a matter of time before the planets collide, the next step would be to create large rocket ships to fly us out of the Earth. With Mars, Venus, and Jupiter revolving close to us, it won't be easy to do so. All the space debris will be blocking us from exiting the space zone area. 
The only safe place outside this region will be many millions of miles away, where only single planets exist. They may or may not have the conditions to host life. But humans will have the technology to land just about anywhere with similar gravity and construct the right shelters. Eventually, Mars, Venus, Earth, and Jupiter will collide with each other and break like eggs. Like a big space omelet. Don't forget the moon's crashing and breaking in the mix, but we'll already be far, far away by then. Hopefully.